Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell. You'll get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And when I'm not asking Bruce, hey, how big was Batista's? Well, you know. One of the things I like to do is help people save money. And if you're watching this video right now and you're in a 30 year loan, man, you're overpaying your single biggest bill and you may not even realize it. I want you to do a little experiment for me. Take your calculator out, multiply your monthly house payment by 360 payments. That's how many payments there are in a 30 year loan. That big scary number, that's your total of payments. You're looking at that number? You know you can do better. Keep more of your own money right now and go to SaveWithConrad.com. Or maybe you've got credit card debt. Man, it's not a matter of if I can save you money with that. Your average interest rate on a credit card is more than 20%. And by the way, all the interest you pay on those credit cards, it's not tax deductible. Whereas the mortgage interest, well, that is tax deductible. So if you owe this debt, it's up to you how to pay it back. Doesn't it make sense to get the cheapest rate possible and the greatest tax deduction possible? Find out how much money you can save right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit, even scores in the 500s can be approved, and it's no cost out of pocket. But maybe best of all, we're licensed in more than 40 states. We can help more families than ever before. But how much can we save you? Find out right now for free with a quick quote from SaveWithConrad.com. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to my world. And of course, we couldn't do it without the Hall of Famer, your friend in mine, Double J, Jeff Jarrett. Jeff, how are you, man? Oh, Conrad Thompson, it is a pleasant surprise to hear your voice, your chipper. You know, we didn't get to hear it last week. You were playing the poopy pants. And uh, the week before that, uh, it's when you, you prepped yourself to get to take an ass whooping on the UT, uh, Bama deal, which just kind of, we did, I mean, we, we, we did total an asshole. Oh, here we go. Oh, yeah. But you're going to like, oh, it's great. What a great game. Once in 16 years, buddy, I'm pumped about this Saturday. Cause as you and I are recording this, this Saturday, we thought we had the game of the century a few weeks ago, this Saturday coming in on a 10 and a half point favor or underdog, the Tennessee volunteers try to continue that incredible run that hooker Hyatt connection that nobody has the answer for. They're going to take it down to Georgia and Georgia number one in the nation, the bulldogs, 10 and a half point favorites. I saw some books have them 11 and a half point favorites. 11 and a half is what I heard. I told Tony Shivani, I'd take Tennessee in the points. You fashion yourself a, a soothsayer for all things, college football and betting. What would you do? You see my picks this weekend. Pick me. Hey, I'm on a roll. Double J's hot takes are on a roll. In case you weren't aware, I know you have multiple things going on in your world, but in my world, yes, my world, I'm on a roll, pal. Uh, but 11 and a half. So, how is it the game of the century? That's what I kind of chuckled at. Well, it's see, one versus three. I mean, listen, the it's a big game, but look, look at the spread. So without a doubt, I'd take Tennessee in the points, but I, I want the, the, the true W. So, uh, you know, I'd, I'd love to, if, if you, if you don't get the dub, do you think you're almost assured a spot in the college football playoff? Because the reality would be Georgia would go to the sec championship. Tennessee would not. But regardless of what happens there, you're a one loss team who lost to number one and you beat Alabama. You got to think, even if you lose, there's a real good chance you're in the college football playoff. Wouldn't you agree? Quick timeout. I, I wish my man Cody could hear this because Conrad now in our household due to that Tennessee Bama game, Cody always goes to, Hey, Hey, I wonder what Conrad would think. I wonder what Conrad <laughs> you've become. <laughs> it's Conrad. It's great. It is absolutely you're you are the uh, the 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 end all be all of football conversations, and it's from Co Cody. Hey, Dad, what do you think Conrad would think? I don't care what Conrad would think. I love it. <laughs> anyway, um, one loss to to number one Georgia. With you, and you got Michigan, you got Ohio State, you're gonna have Bama coming on like a freight train. Um, I mean, let's just go doomsday. 
let's yeah. say Alabama or let's say Georgia beats Tennessee, Alabama beats Georgia. Now Georgia has one loss. Tennessee has one loss. Alabama. Alabama has one loss, but Alabama has now won the sec championship. Yep. If we're playing that doomsday scenario, you got three teams there that should, could, would, in theory say, well, I should be in the playoffs. And it's kind of hard to argue. Oh yeah. But that would really only mean one other team could slot in. And that's not happening. So is it Ohio state or is it Michigan? I mean, there's going to be, my point is this is when college football gets way more fun to me than the NFL. So let's just, let's pretend that Tennessee does lose, which I don't think is necessarily a bad thing because I think I, if I was, if I was, I say to myself, I say self self, if I'm going to lose in college football, I think I'd rather lose early rather than later. So I think as awesome as it would be to play in the SEC championship, if I wound up losing, meaning if I beat Georgia, but then I go to the SEC championship, play Tennessee again or Alabama again, and Alabama beats us. That feels like that's worse for Tennessee than losing to Georgia right now. Would you agree with that? I a hundred percent. We're in alignment, pal. Yes. It, which is. It is, it is, I always love to, and, you know, bring it back to wrestling. That's why week to week it yeah. is do or die. Yes. It's a little redemption here. You know, Lawler is going to get screwed out of the belt this weekend, but he's still got a shot to, to, to go for the championship when uh, the nature boy comes to town, but no, it's, um, college football, is something else. And, and, uh, the, the, the good teams just keep getting better. Well, I can't wait to see what happens. I hope that Georgia and Tennessee and Alabama are all there at the end. I don't think it'll happen that way, but that's why we watch the games. So hopefully you guys are checking it out before we get talking about our topic today, which we were supposed to do last week, but I pulled up lame. You and I've both, uh, been battling a little chest rattle last week. Mine was so bad. I could barely form full sentences. I did an episode, uh, of, uh, ask Conrad for adfreeshows.com. It, it was less than an hour. I took like 11 breaks Whew. rough, but I'm feeling a lot better now and ready to talk a little Dixie Carter. But before we do, we should address that this Saturday, it's not just about college football. Roman reigns is going to Saudi Arabia and facing an opponent. Nobody ever predicted would be in that ring with him, especially for the title, Mr. Logan Paul. Speaking of things we didn't think would happen a couple of years ago, Logan's younger brother, Jake Paul actually beat Anderson Silva over the weekend on a Showtime boxing pay-per-view. Oh I got to check it out. Uh, I didn't think it was nearly as lopsided as the scorecards did, but he removed all doubt when in the eighth and final round, he knocked Anderson down only for the second time in Anderson's very brief boxing career, but still what a legendary striker, even if he is a little older. And uh, I know there's lots of questions now about, okay, he beat an old guy who's not really a boxer. Is he really that good? Let's let the kid have a little victory lap. He beat Anderson Silva on pay-per-view. I thought it was fantastic to watch. I got my money's worth. I'm curious if you saw it and what your prediction is this Saturday about his older brother, Logan, tying it up with our tribal chief. Where do I start, Conrad? Um... Didn't make it, saw the highlights, thought uh, had it, uh, watched a couple of the uh, undercards. They had, had uh, two guys that were like 5'2", five, 5'3". Five, Did you see any of that fight? Uh, I can't saw the whole thing. They were tearing it up. They were they were throwing they were throwing some little, little feisty fellers. The the eighteen year who eighteen year old who co main evented who was signed to um, Jake Paul's fighting company his most valuable promotions company yep. He's now seven and oh, or eight and oh, all knockouts, 10 time amateur champ out of long beach, California, man, at 133 pounds, he might be one of the next big things. So say what we will about Jake Paul, but man, he's, he's trying some things. He's putting his money where his mouth is. And it feels like he's made a worthwhile investment with him. What'd you think of, uh, his performance or what you saw the highlights? So, so. I'll tell you what, you know, uh, I'll tell you what I told Karen last night. Um, she, uh, joined into Efren's game event, uh, speaking of ad free show, she, she loved it. So just, she wanted me to let you know that as I walked up the steps today, 
she's all in on that. She's all in on ad free shows. She was like, I can't believe and I'm like, Hey, they got a lot of things in ad free. You, I mean, it's a, anyhow, this is an ad free uh, discussion. Uh, you know what I told her Conrad on Sunday? Cause, uh, scrolling while the Titans game was on watching different highlights. I said, they are doing professional wrestling. Yes. Reimagined. Yes. And I couldn't be happier. It, it, it is intriguing. It is thought provoking. It is professional wrestling evolved. Mm -hmm. Um, they, they it, it's another spin, but look, he owns the promotion yes. and, and so did Bill Watts and so did Jerry Jarrett and, and so did Daddy Graham and so did Vern Gagne. And then obviously the McMahon's all, all the, no. so they, you know, however you want to slice and dice it, Silva, Silva, Anderson Silva boxed his boss Saturday night. Yes. Uh, I thought both put on a good performance. What a hell of a payday. What a great buzz and hats off to little brother, uh, he heading to Saudi Arabia against the tribal chief and how that's being packaged up. So, um, who would have thought five years ago when, uh, the Paul brothers were shooting these YouTube videos that they would be getting into sports entertainment, but they were actually sports entertainers back then. Fantastic job. Uh, I'm pulling for Jake. Can't wait to see what he's doing next. Uh, I think finish. About, what's the finish. You mean about Logan Paul? Yeah. Well, first of all, let me go back to Jake. I think Jake okay. is going to wind up fighting Nick Diaz or Nate Diaz. And I think it sets all kinds of pay-per-view records. Agreed. Uh, it'll be the biggest spectacle fight since Mike Tyson fought Roy Jones. It's hard to fuck with Mike Tyson. I mean, he is regarded in a, in a pop culture reference, you know, just rare air. But if you're a UFC fan, you're going to want to see Nate Diaz. And if you hate Jake Paul or you love Jake Paul, you're going to want to see Jake Paul. So the idea that that is the next match, I think sets all kinds of box office records. I don't think that anybody needs to kid themselves that Jake Paul can even hang around Canelo. Uh, and I don't think that Conor McGregor would entertain this. And I don't think Dana White would even allow it to happen, but Nate Diaz. I think it's going to happen and, uh, I'm going to do all I can to be there to see it because that's going to be, uh, a cartoon that I want to be a part of, but this Saturday, uh, Ariel Hawani was trying to plug this a lot during the pay-per-view and, and I greatly appreciate <laughs> him. He is such a big wrestling fan. It's like, uh, I, I just, I love Ariel uh, so much for trying to do what he could for professional wrestling, but this Saturday, I personally. Hope they go away that a lot of wrestling fans are not going to like. I say, I know the bloodline is doing great stuff. And I know that everybody loves Paul Heyman, but what Logan Paul needs is a mouthpiece. And if he was the guy to upset Roman reigns, I know people are going to say it's David Arquette, but they're not alike at all. One's an actor. One of them has fought Floyd Mayweather. One of them's younger brother just beat Anderson Silva. It's a heck of a story and a lot of mainstream attention, way more mainstream attention, especially of the younger variety than David Arquette could bring to WCW back in the day. That was a, a grab to try to see if we could get the cover of the USA today. And for that, it worked. But if you are in the wrestling circle online, the IWC, the conversation, you see things that say that the average viewer of WWE programming is over 50 years old. If you want that to skew younger, you'd have to look pretty hard to find somebody who could bring a younger audience than Logan Paul. Logan Paul is going to skew to younger males. Uh, those 18 to 34s, if that's really what you're looking for, Logan Paul's the guy. And we need something to get wrestling in front of those folks. And the bad bunny experiment worked and exceeded expectations. And the Pat McAfee experiment worked and exceeded expectations. And Logan Paul's taking this very, very seriously. He's had more than fair outings in the ring. In my opinion, I think if we've got enough story and we get enough garnish around him, I'd turn Paul Heyman. And I'd have Paul Heyman help Logan Paul win the title in Saudi Arabia. That will just take over social media. And if we could just get a little bit of a run out of that for a bit, especially if hypothetically 
we're headed towards Roman running a more reduced schedule or hypothetically, if we're headed towards Roman, maybe having a match with the rock at WrestleMania, do you really need the world title for that? Logan Paul gets a lot of attention. And if he just had a brief run to survivor series, and then we reset and do something else, man, that could be a lot of fun. I dig it. I hope it gets old school. I hope, uh, Logan Paul is the WWE champ come Sunday morning. What say you, you were talking about the viewership, man, you, you, man, there, that's a lot to unpack on your, uh, uh, comments you just made a lot to unpack. One thing about your number, about the average viewer, that's TV viewer. And so, I mean, this is something that can be debated forever. The audience in general, whether it's my 16 year old son or daughters or, however it may be, they're consuming their content on their phones, YouTube, Twitter. When we, I got a text, I don't know when it was, I don't know, seven, 10 days ago. And, and the guy goes, Hey man, I just listened to your episode about uh, when we talked about don't be stupid. Uh, complaining is not a strategy yeah. that, that episode. I, I continue to get feedback because people don't listen to it. You know, they're, they're catching up or whatever yeah, it may yeah. be that whole social media vibe and i said that's what the paul brothers they they didn't they weren't on dancing with the stars or the voice or uh some kind of athletic they they got over on social media and now they're bringing that to a televised product i'm hoping like hell a wrestler somehow has that mentality and and thinks that way because that's kind of it's not kind of it is what happening so your scenario there of laying out uh the paul kid becoming champion, I think would work in just over and I think in every kind of way, do I think they're going to do it? No, I don't. I just don't think they'll switch the title in Saudi, but look, me and you were sitting here talking about it. We're chatting about it. Online audience is talking about it, chatting about it. You're talking about getting the audience younger. I think the males 18 to 34, they're not going to sit down on Monday night for three hours. They're going to clip it up. They're going to watch it real time on, on, bits and pieces you can watch it on twitter and and i the the conversation and i'm not talking about the small winded post and folks going back and forth over some silliness which is fun to observe the 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 paul guys brothers they just dominate the 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 conversation Mm -hmm. and i'm curious i i guess I'm, i'm 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 thinking down the line i don't think they'll switch it but where does Logan fit in the WrestleMania picture? That, I, that's going to be interesting because I do like, and I don't, I said it at um, money for Mongo. As far as belts and storyline, you don't need it. R- Roman does not need the title right now. I mean, Sami Zayn's the star of that entire attraction right now. You pull him out of that. It, it, it's a completely different dynamic now. Yes. It, it, it's it, it, to me, Sammy. Uh, it's so go ahead. You, my uh, thing is, you know, we don't necessarily need Paul Heyman and Sammy with the bloodline. Agreed. Sammy being the mouthpiece for the bloodline. And then, I mean, think about what they did. Listen, it's easy for us to kind of forget this, but once upon a time, a lot of the hardcore internet wrestling community fans, they just hated anything and everything that Roman Reigns did. It took him being on camera exactly one scene with Paul Heyman and everyone's opinion changed. So the way people feel when they listen to this right now about Logan Paul, let Paul Heyman go out and talk about Logan Paul after he beat Roman Reigns. Boy, you got a whole new kit and caboodle. Yep. And there's a guy hanging out there who everybody thinks will be back in time for WrestleMania season named Cody Rhodes. I mean, I could see Cody beating Logan Paul at WrestleMania on night one and then rock and Roman night two. I could see it. This is a guy who's gone out and he's wrestled Stephen Amell with WWE. He's gone out on live TV on TNT and wrestled Shaq. I'm not saying that's what's going to happen. I'm fantasy booking and just saying there's a lot of intrigue and a lot of things that could happen. I don't know what's going to happen, but if we're honest, I kind of thought when they were across the pond you know, Labor Day weekend at the castle show, I thought for sure Drew was winning the title. 
and that didn't happen. So I don't remember the last time that I was this in tune and excited about world title matches as I have been recently with Roman Reigns. So they're doing something right. And I can't wait to see what they do this Saturday. And I can't wait for us to talk about Dixie Carter. But before we do, I want to remind everybody that the nights are getting longer, but the breeze isn't the only thing that's getting stiff. It's also double J's ding dong. That's right. This episode is sponsored by blue chew guys. We all know confidence can take you far in life so far that sometimes you can have a boss of wood guitar and Bob Vila glasses and still become world champion. It's that type of confidence we need in the bedroom, especially when it's time to step up to the plate. That's where blue chew comes in. It's like a hot tag for your wiener. Blue chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis but in chewable form and at a fraction of the cost. You can take them anytime, day or night, so you can plan ahead or be ready whenever an opportunity arises. Now, y'all, the process is simple. You sign up at bluechew.com. You consult with one of their licensed medical providers, and once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. And the best part? Well, it's all done online. That means no visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversations, and no waiting in line at the pharmacy. Bluechew's tablets are made in the USA. They prepare and ship directly to your door, all in a discreet package. So if you could benefit from extra confidence when it's time to perform, chew it and do it. Have better sex, y'all. And we got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free when you use our promo code MYWORLD at checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. That's BlueChew.com. The promo code is MYWORLD to receive your first month for free. Visit BlueChew.com for more details and important safety information. And we want to thank Blue Chew for sponsoring the podcast and Double J's Ween. All right, so let's get into it. We mentioned a couple of (laughs) me and Cassio before we dig into this, uh, Cassio did a fantastic job and it was obviously the topic fit with road dog and all this. We had a lot of fun, but my man Cassio just can't do a uh, blue chew read like you Conrad. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. I have no idea. You just, there's an art to your ad reads. Well, I appreciate you saying that, you know, he's the professional of the bunch. He's number one in radio in Huntsville, Alabama which, you know, Bruce Pritchard would say is a kid in being the shift leader, Burger King, but I digress. <laughs> the man has been number one in the book for over a decade. Has so, he really? Oh yeah, for sure. Like if you're a dude and you listen to the radio in North Alabama, you listen to Cassio kid. Uh, and I hope you guys are listening to Cassio kid every week on, Oh, you didn't know him and road dog are having a lot of fun, creating a lot of, Oh uh, boy, those two, fake. but boy, you want to talk about fun. From the minute they click record until they stop, they're just cutting up. And uh, I think you should check it out. Infectious laugh. Sir, now we getting down to the topic, pal. Dixie Carter, man. We we teased this a couple of weeks ago at the end of the show because I think most people know the story. Uh, well, she was PR for TNA and then, all right, we'll get there. But that's not the first time you met Dixie Carter. Tell us the full story of how you first met Dixie Carter way back when. So I'm trying to think how, how, how to uh, tell this story to you. So, so the, the listener, the my world listener can, um, put them to the story. Let me try to alley you though. It's, no, the, no. it's the late eighties. Yeah. Yeah. Your dad has bought into business and in world-class you're going back and forth from Texas to Tennessee. Yes. To make money in two different territories. Of course, so you stop right there. Okay. Fast forward to me, Ron Harris, uh, Dixie Carter, Andy Barton. Andy Barton uh, was her partner in Trifecta Entertainment at the time. And we went to interview um, in back to back interviews, uh, me and, and I took Ron with me in the formative stage. This is in the spring of 2002 i'm interviewing different pr companies to f- see who's going to be the the pr agent uh, in nashville that's going to have sources in la and new york and we go in and the meeting had been set up and we're sitting around the table and we're you know has uh, you have small talk or chit chat before the actual meeting goes and the presentation and all that kind of stuff and we're having that and all of a sudden dixie is at one end of the table who would have thought, you know, in six months and nine months that I'd be sitting around that table 
it just, it just it was bizarre how it happened but anyway sitting around the table and chit chatting and this and that and water and tea and coffee and all this kind of stuff and dixie goes wait a minute before we get started jeff did you ever live in dallas mm. and i look at her and i go nope well wait a minute i'm I can't say that I never, cause I've always said that I've been blessed. I've been lucky that traveled all over the world in the wrestling industry. And I've always had a Hendersonville, Tennessee address. So I, I'm, and I just reactively said, Nope. And then she said, really? And I said, well, in the late eighties, and she started nodding her head in the late eighties, my dad had an apartment. She said, Las Colinas. I said, yep. And. So we would go back and forth and blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden I'm thinking to myself, man, she knows a lot now. What the hell? How does she know all this? And then all of a sudden, oh, she, oh Hackberry Creek apartments. She, when she came out with that, she said, you lived in Hackberry Creek. I'm thinking this lady's reading my mind. And then she goes, ah, I live there too. And I, Conrad, a flashback. I'm like, yes. And I, and she's like, y'all had some kind of, I don't know, because apartment uh, parking in the lot, you have a sign, all this kind of stuff. And she's like, I can remember where y'all were this building. Anyway, she said, y'all had like a, a red. And I'm like, oh, it's a two door uh, maroon Lincoln that so-and-so, yeah, anyway. So she recalled it. So my first meeting with Dixie Carter was, at an apartment at, at we both lived in the same apartment complex we were the, only there on weekends me and my dad coming and going and we saw each other in the, the lot uh parking lot going in back, back back and forth to our cars a couple times and said hey how you doing hey how you doing and that was it but i'd literally met her in the parking lot lived in the same apartment complex in uh 88 89 90. small world huh uh, it's just crazy man <laughs> i i, I mean... look over at me and I could maybe on a USW episode, I'll, uh, I'll just, I'll just tee this up, Conrad. Here's a story behind the story. So we were out there mainly Thursday, Friday, Saturday, go out Thursday night, work a show, work sportatorium Friday, sportatorium Saturday morning, spot show Saturday, whatever it is. But we were weekends. We'll call it that during the week, uh, we were gone. So the apartment just stayed locked up. Well, Billy Joe Travis, God rest his soul. Old Billy Joe, uh, who we made towns with and all that kind of stuff, he was coming over, uh, you know, picking up rides and all this. He met this young lady that also lived in the apartment complex and started dating her, uh, if you will. And um, Wait, why did you laugh when you said dating her? <laughs> so, so have you, do you know this? Have I told you this Conrad? No, I just, I laughed when you said dating like you did. Keep going. <laughs> so that was the story that me and, uh, old, old Jerry knew basically. So <laughs> Conrad, uh, you non-video listeners, Conrad's just shaking his head back and forth. Well, when a guy it, says he started, uh, dating her <laughs> excuse me anyway uh so when we would uh, anyway so oh you got you got to know billy but he was a charmer and hey jeff um yeah i know y'all are gone you think i could come swimming over at your pool just use your pool during the week and this and that and, hey man ask my dad it's his a complex you gotta have the code to get in and you know all that kind of stuff and I was like, yeah, sure, no problem. So he was just using the pool during the week, if you will, because he was <clears throat> dating a girl. Well, Conrad, come to find out, it was a pilot's wife. <laughs> well, that's less than ideal. Yeah. So, so that whole thing unraveled, but that same apartment complex. So I don't remember vividly for me, meeting Dixie Carr and all that, but, but I do remember when that all went south that whole relationship and the pilot um, headed to the airport, Billy headed to the apartment complex, headed to the pool to, to see his girl that he was dating pilot uh, went to have a flight and something happened and the pilot pilot turned around and came back. And um, let's just say 
It didn't go well. It didn't go well. Yes. Yes. Yeah. The jet engines were revving and, uh, that, that, that day, that flight didn't take, uh, <laughs> rough <laughs> landing, rough landing, yeah. a little turbulence well, to just be clear. I want to just put a cap on what we just talked about. Billy Joe Travis had nothing to do with Dixie Carter. Oh gosh. No, no. It's, it's two separate stories. I know, but I'm just saying people will conflate that and we'll get quoted everywhere. We're not implying Billy Joe Travis even knew Dixie Carter. He did and not to my knowledge. Yeah. So let's fast forward now, 2002, we're launching TNA. We've discussed, you know, how the whole PR thing came to be. Um, you know, you're, you're trying to figure out who's going to be a good firm and a good opportunity to sort of represent, uh, TNA on a national basis. You interview Dixie. Uh, ultimately you, you decide to go with Dixie. What was it about Dixie and your meeting with her that made you think, Hey guys, this is the one And just before you answer, let me remind everybody you've talked to people about lawyer services and things like that. And sometimes you're negotiating some trade. So, you know, we could write big checks to attorney firms, or we could bring them in and give them equity. And they would see the big vision of what this is. They see WWE has gone public. There's a bunch of cash there that saves you from writing checks. And hopefully they see the vision and they're really bought in and, and they're going to be good partners. So you're trying to a find the best talent you can, but B also run this like a, a, a profit and loss, a, a, a small business should you're not going out and raising funds necessarily. You're trying to do this the old fashioned way, but what was it about Dixie that stood out to you and made you think we found it? A couple of phone calls from different folks around town. I talked to, um, obviously music city has all kinds of music agents, but I talked to different industry folks within the industry that, Hey, and they, you know, they always gave me, we'll say the same three to five to seven names. And then I narrowed it down and narrowed it down. And it always kind of came back Dixie in this one or Dixie in that one, all this. So I inter ended up interviewing both of them and in the meeting, two things. Um, very professional. Like, like I, I don't want to say that, you know, the, the nuts and bolts of the wrestling industry, but very professional, the bids were comparable. We were going to retain her, uh, retain her company services on a monthly retainer. And, and maybe there was a case by case basis, they get paid more, but above anything is, is that Dixie was more than a PR agent. She, you know, at one time she managed Tanya Tucker. People were may or may, may not know that name, but you know, she had been in management. She had been in marketing. She had accounts of billiards association, Levi jeans. I mean, she had some uh, national accounts and the professionalism. And, and I think more than anything is, is that she was much more than PR savvy. Um, and most of the companies that I talked to or actually visited or, or, or the one that the, the one that we interviewed later that day, they were very narrow in their lane. They, they cut and paste from a PR agency. And I had, you know, worked at WWF and WCW and really knew that the PR side of things and getting in bed with in demand, it, you got to be diverse and, and, uh, Hey, it's the end of the day, it's also the professional wrestling business. It's not cookie cutter, cut and paste corporate, uh, public relations stuff. Although you got to have that skill set too. And connections. She had connections in New York and LA because she had an experience of, uh, on the management side, on the marketing side, on the account side, all the things that go with it. Get even more from the hottest new podcast going my world with Jeff Jarrett over at adfreeshows.com. Let me get granular here for a minute, folks. Not only can you get the entire my world episode library with zero ads, new episodes come your way each week early ad free and on video starting at just nine bucks a month. We've also got tons of exclusive my world bonus content waiting for you. Plus unique interactive experiences with your old pal, double J you get to jump on and ask Jeff questions. And if you joined us in Chicago this year for top guy weekend, you got to hang out the entire weekend, 100% the best value in all of wrestling. Strut on over to adfreeshows.com right now to sign up. So she, um, she obviously gets the, the opportunity. And then somehow, some way, and we've discussed this before in the archives, 
as you're trying to run around and raise funds and just keep T and a from flatlining, of course, you thought you had the golden goose and Richard Scrooge and health South. That whole thing went sideways. Some of my favorite content we've ever created on my world in the archives. Be sure to check that out. But then you realize, well, he's got bigger hands, bigger issues at hand than my yeah. wrestling company. You think? So what do we do now? And somehow, some way Dixie says, well, I may have a solution. I know we've touched on it before. Briefly recap how it was revealed that boy, Dixie could be a much bigger resource to the company than just PR. To me, this is something about just doing the next right thing. Now, I didn't really know this lesson very well in 2002, but as time has gone on, just doing the next right thing, somehow, some way, things always work their way out. So not to, you already did, told the story, screw she's out. So now um, as a part of that phone call, uh, the chief financier of Health South said on the phone, not only are we not paying the line of credit, you know, the, the line of credit that you have right now goes away now, like as in now, but not only does it go away, we're not funding last week's show. So that's about another 150 grand. So when those chips just rolled in that way, I went, okay, I've got uh, less than a month to figure this out, to go raise capital. And so knowing the forecast in front of me, I kind of looked around and said, okay, here's the situation. We're going to kind of find out who really wants to stay on this and is going to dig in and row the ship. And I mean, get in the boat although it has holes all over it at this time quickly, we're going to find out who wants to start rowing and who's going to bail off. And so as a part of that process, you know, talent was obviously a huge concern production, a huge concern, but then all of my vendors and all of my accounts. <clears throat> and so I set up meetings with, uh, if they were in Nashville, I said, I'm going to do this in person and look them face to face and eye to eye and tell them. And then the ones that weren't in town had to make phone calls. So I said, called Dixie. I said, Hey Dixie, um, I need to stop by the office and have a conversation with you. And I did Conrad went in and sort of rolled out exactly what the situation was and say, and basically said, I know we have an agreement in place. I've paid you for this month, but moving forward, um, that, that, that I don't at this time, I don't have the funds to pay you, but I'm going to figure this out, but I don't want to get into a situation to say, Oh, I forgot to tell you this or, Oh, the oh, whole Rob, Peter, pay Paul and me, me and you both have had conversations about this in small business and just in life, just be truthful about it. So I went in and had that conversation with her and Conrad, <clears throat> different images that you different have in, in your, in your life and businesses. But when she laid, <coughs> excuse me, when she sort of sat back in her chair and she said, can you tell me a little bit more about what's going on? That's kind of first question. The second question, like how much money are we talking about? And uh, who all are you talking to? And just kind of the different questions. And I said, well, she said, do you think you could put together a, a basically a capital raise document? I said, I already have one. I, I, you know, it's, 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 it's not in depth. We don't have enough, but I've got, you know, plenty of documents to put together. She said, okay, uh, get it to me when you can. And Labor Day weekend was coming up. Uh, so this is August. Labor Day weekend was coming up. And so we got her that document and she called and she basically said, do you think you and whoever could come to Dallas? And I go, what's that? She goes, my father and his organization and me and, and, uh, you know, whoever like to meet with you guys. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and that was, uh, I'll stop there kind of and let you steer the ship. But, th but that was me telling her basically screw she's out. 
open the door for her to make a call to her father. And so, you know, Bob Carter, majority, uh, owner, uh, ran Panda energy international Dallas based energy company. You go out there and we've, we've told the story before where you meet with him. You happen to have the cover of the Nashville newspaper where the Titans had mixed it up with you on a pay-per-view and got some headlines. He really was fascinated by that story and the media coverage it got. Maybe he saw that as an opportunity, but you thought it was going well. I think you've told the story that you fly home on a private jet. Eventually some discussions are made and Panda is going to become an investor. And use miles, use miles to fly from Nashville to Dallas. Yep. Flew home, flew, home, flew, flew back private. And, and so just, just to give the, my world listener who hasn't heard, heard that, I, I want to respect that going through this is that I think timing is everything. Yes. Panda was on fire power plants all over the world. So the capital was there. WWE obviously went public in 99. So this is 2002, three, you know, so they they have three years of financials that are public and it's a massive organization and very, very profitable. Um, so, so the WWE comparable Panda timing, um, I, I, now that I look back the stage in life that the entire Cardi fa Carter family was at, uh, and you know, the, what you just said, we were three months old company and you know, the Titans thing story was a, a nice little illustration of excitement and fun. And it just isn't wrestling. So talk me through how the deal comes together. Um, I, I mean, there's that, that, that wasn't real complicated because it was, people were like, well, did you pursue this? Once Bob said, we want to move forward. It was, and, and there was a little bit of a conversation like, so your attorneys like, and I'm like, Hey, let's cut a deal. You guys are coming at, at this 11th hour. The King family, there were other conversations and we probably had four or five conversations. We had banks engaged. We had, uh, angel investors, all kind of different scenario, but here was somebody who stepped up and said, I'm ready to pull the full weight. It, it was literally, okay, let's do a bridge loan. We did a bridge loan maybe from September one. I think it might've run through December one, like a 90 day bridge loan to give us time, give us operating capital, but time, but time to close, um, all the legal documents. And, it, and here's the thing that gave me a lot of comfort, um, is, is that, and J Janice said this, that's Dixie's mother, Janice Carter said this at least 10 times in this series. And, and Bob said it too, Jeff, you worry about the wrestling we're going to do everything else we're going to do finance we're going to do legal we'll we'll, we'll do all the good stuff you go focus on wrestling and create the best product i mean it just it, you know because dixie had like i said more than just a pr skill a marketing skill mm -hmm. and just everything that went with it and it was like wow it, it was it was you know you you bring on different other folks and you're going to have to make sure you're still going to have to do the finance side and all the different pieces of the puzzle. The Carters came in and said, you go do wrestling. I'll do everything else. So as far as the corporate structure, you know, we'll call it an org chart. Yep. Does this acquisition put Bob at the top of the heap or yes. does he decide we're going to make Dixie the top of the heap? Just talk us through how that happened. Because I wish I would, I would have, Dixie, whether and it wasn't on paper and it wasn't even in, it, I, look, I, we knew that it was coming. We didn't know it was coming that quick, but it was a set of circumstances. The, the org chart had me and my father, for the lack of a better word, running the show, making the decisions. Uh, and 
you know, we had to submit budgets and here's what the draw was going to be. You know, we were running the show with the defined budget. Uh, so, you know, Panda, so Bob Carter, Janice Carter, Dixie, it's a family business. So I wasn't bogged down in the weeds from a big time or jar or chart corporate structure. They were, fa they were a family. Yeah. Dick brought the investment to her family. So as far as just the day to day, you know, when it's laid out, Jeff, you just do the wrestling. We'll do everything else. Uh, at this point you have offices in Nashville. Is she showing up every day? So the early days, and I'll say that until the Carters came on, our offices were in Hendersonville, right up here on main street. Uh, that's, that's where the offices were. And our, our man, Dan Engler, Rudy Charles was, you know, day one answering phones and Jeremy Borash and Ron Harris and, uh, my dad we probably had five offices shout out to Mortimer Plumtree. Uh, he, you know, he was in the office in those early days, but when they, um, when I say they pronouns, pal, when the, when the Carters, uh, took over immediately, they wanted the headquarters to be in coming stations, 209 10th Avenue South. That's where trifecta, uh, Dixie's PR company was. So we immediately moved there and that was the new TNA headquarters. When do you remember? I mean, I remember reading that Dixie becomes the president of the company in spring of 2003. Okay. What's the process that gets her from, Hey, we're all doing this together and you do this and I'll do that. And well, now I'm the president. I never took that as any kind of, I guess, kind of the way you, you roll that out there, not even a red light, a flashing light, or oh, it was okay. She's named. So, because we had a transition of, and we'll get to his name in a minute, uh, in the, in the notes, Chris Sobel, that I always looked at Dixie from day one, her most important job when this went down. Yes. She, she was uh trifecta, uh, public relations and marketing. Um, but, but her number one job above that, I call it investor relations. That's how, because that's her family and the communication and, um, you know, she was the investor's eyes and ears in Nashville. That's how I viewed it. And so when she became the, the title of, of the president, I didn't really look too much into that one way or another Panda, which from day one re really surprised me that that uh, gentleman, the first one was Chris Sobel. They sent him to Nashville and I swear to you, Conrad, and I got it that he was the investor's eyes and ears, but at times I would scratch my head and go, does Bob want this guy to piss everybody off? Is that how he does business? Maybe he does. Maybe he doesn't because he could not have been more abrasive. Hmm. I mean, and I get it. Uh, I mean, I, I totally get that, you know, this is an investor relationship, but it was, it was difficult from day one. Well, I'll tell you what's not difficult for me and you these days, and that's sleeping. Science tells us the best way to achieve and maintain consistent deep sleep is by lowering our core body temperature. Temperature controlled sleep repairs your muscles after a hard day's work and it improves your cognitive function. So you always start your day feeling sharp and alert. Now, Jeff, I want to ask you, you've lived in the South your whole life. How many times have you had a bedroom in a house as an adult where you didn't have a ceiling fan over your bed? Jeff. What? Never mind. Sleep you know, is the new home for Chili Sleep. We're bringing you the same great sleep that Chili Sleep offers, but under a new name. Don't sleep on Chili Sleep like Jeff is sleeping on this commercial. Sleep Me makes the coldest and most comfortable sleep systems available. They create the environment that meets the body's natural need for lower core temperatures, promoting deeper, more restorative sleep. Chili sleep makes the Uller, the cube and the doc pro sleep system. Either way, they're all water-based temperature controlled mattress toppers. These bad boys fit over your existing mattress to provide you your ideal sleep temperature. Folks think of it as like a smart thermostat for your bed. Now I've got the Uller. So does Jeff. 
And these mattress pads keep your bed at the perfect temperature for deep, cold sleep. These systems are helped are, are here to help you fall asleep, stay asleep, and give you the confidence and energy to power through your day. Really think about this. Can you even imagine waking up and not feeling tired? That used to be my existence. I was groggy. I was not a morning person. I hated it. I would toss and turn. I felt like I was fussing with the covers, fussing with the pillow. And then sometimes after lunch, man, I'd crash. I'd take a little power nap at the office. I don't have to do any of that anymore. No more tossing and turning. No more naps in the afternoon. I'm sleeping better than ever. And I know it because I'm having bright, vivid, colorful dreams. I didn't even have dreams before chilly sleep, but they've just launched something I'm jealous of. It's called the new doc pro sleep system. It has two times more cold power than the other models. It's whisper quiet. It has a tubeless mattress pad design. It allows for five times more cooling contact. And check this out. They've got the sleep.me app. You're talking enhanced device control. That's right. Use your phone like a remote control to adjust the temperature. Even schedule your sleep. My wife does this on her side of the bed. She wants to climb into a warm bed, but she doesn't want to get all hot and sweaty when she sleeps. So it cools her down as she sleeps, but it warms her up to wake her up. Head on over to sleep.me forward slash my world to learn more and save 25% off the purchase of any new Doc Pro, Cube, or Uller sleep system. This offer is available exclusively for my world with double J listeners and only for a limited time. That's S L E E P dot M E slash my world to take advantage of our exclusive discounts and wake up feeling refreshed every day. Sleep.me forward slash my world, double J tested, double J approved. Amen. You never pitched to me on ad reads in the middle of a read. I saw you texting and wanted to throw you off. That was on me. Well, I asked, I'll ask you again though. Cause I don't know. Cause I've never been in your bedroom. Thank God. Yeah. Uh, Pal. You got a ceiling <laughs> fan in your bedroom? No, sir. What the fuck? You ain't really from the South. You running around here claiming to be from the South. Every bedroom I've ever had, had a ceiling fan. Now I don't need them now that I got chilly sleep, but dude, come on now. Well, you know what? Here's the difference. You've always run around here with negative 8% body fat. And I, I got my protective karate fat. So I, I run a little hot. So I got to have a ceiling fan in every bed I, I've ever had. I am going to send you a pic today of the fan that I have in my, it, it's, it's a, what do you call it? Just a, a, a fan that sits on the ground. You got an oscillating fan buddy. And that thing rattles it's, it's metal and it, has, it, it is. Oh yeah. No, I want you to just imagine this. Uh, Jeff Jarrett, he ain't going to tell you this. He lives in about a $5 million lake home. Would you stop? Tennessee. I mean, it's the biggest house on the biggest hill on the big side of town. Oh, Everybody yeah. else in his neighborhood, they got like a hundred feet of water frontage, not double J. No, sir. His is like, he's, he's on a cul-de-sac and y'all know how those lots on the cul-de-sac go, right? They start narrow and get, so the front of his driveway, front of his yard, boy, it's just T tiny. And you think, well, Lord. Bless Jeff. He's just doing as good as he can. You go around to the backside and you realize, well, there's 19 floors to this bad dude. He's got a helicopter pad. He has landed helicopters in his backyard on the shore of the Tennessee river. That's where he's at. And what kind of fan does he have? One of them Walmart rattle jobs from 1987 sitting in the corner. That's yes. double J. If there ever was a double J story. Jeff's going to spend some money on his house, but if it's something that ain't glued or screwed to it, <laughs> we're just going to have to make it work. I just love it. And if Karen was here, she'd be laughing, shaking her head. I just know it. Yes, she would. That's my point. Golly. Lord bless him. People, uh, uh, people give uh, Mick Foley shit about being frugal. <laughs> Jay, he's right up there with you. Now he'll spend money on eating. <laughs> that's right a lot of money on eating and a lot of money on the house but everything else i don't think he's ever worn a shirt on this program he actually paid for i mean that's what i'm <laughs> talking about he's got, got free call the, the chili sleep i am telling you this game changer i the, yeah, it is because it, it regardless of the price and look they're very low price those bad boys Nothing better than a good night's sleep. That's how we got started on this, but it is a game. There's something about lowering that body temperature. I'm going on vacation. Uh, I, I spent my anniversary in Mexico for triple mania without my wife. So I had to sell that. So I'm going to the beach 
this Saturday with my lovely wife and in the trunk, chili, chili. Slip. There you go. It's that, it's that simple folks. If that doesn't tell you how good these things are, nothing will. Here's what we did for a long time. Uh, I used to have the single side cause you can get a chili sleep where it works on one side of the bed, or you can get a chili sleep that's for both sides. And so at first I had the one side Jones and that's what we traveled with. And my wife has had enough of that. We're taking two side Jones this time. Love it. Chili sleep. We're not taking our wife. I mean, we're not taking our parents. We're not taking our kids. We're not taking any friends. Chili sleep. Us and chili sleep. The dogs are going in the kennel. The, uh, the phones are going off and the chili sleep for both sides of the bed, going to the beach, check it out. Roll tide. Love it. All right. So let's talk about Chris Sobel. Uh, it comes out in March, uh, in the torch on March 22nd, Chris Sobel, who was placed in charge of the company by Panda energy was relieved of his duties recently. Not only was he removed from overseeing TNA's day-to-day -day business operation, he's no longer working for Panda Dixie Carter. The daughter of the owners has unofficially assumed Sobel's old position. The Jarrett family is thrilled with the move as they often butted heads with Sobel over budget matters. What can you tell us about Chris Sobel? You said before we went to the break that he couldn't have been more abrasive. Can you give me any examples of that type of behavior? And I realize for the sake of telling a story, you might exaggerate or maybe misremember a fact. I mean, I'm asking about something so specific from over 20 years ago. I don't expect you to quote me just, you know, but basically looking at a sheet and outside you have wrestler, 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 referee, well, you know, you have their job description. Well, why do you got to have so many wrestlers? Well, Chris, uh, it's a two hour show. Well, can we just cut that in half? Uh, we can, and your show is not going to be good. Well, why don't we try that? The, 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 the non. I, it, it kind of got into the disrespect that he showed the industry, but, but the lack of knowledge and the lack of trying to understand from the very beginning, Oh, you got three refs here. Just use one next week. You don't need three, Th those kind of things that were so misguided. And, and, and I mean, just ridiculous. Well, why do you gotta have, I mean, Conrad, we used to eat at the bottom of the hill at the asylum at a little place called the white trash cafe is a meet three. Teddy Hart and CM Punk know it well. Yes, exactly. But literally how easy was it for us that we didn't have to hire catering folks in and pay $9 a plate that the guys hated. I'm not saying the guys loved it, but it was home cooked Southern food, literally, you know, 30 yards at the bottom of the hill that we just had tickets. And we cut a guy with the owner and said, look, some weeks it's going to be, you know, I'm just using number 50, but you know what? The next week it may be 70. Can we just kind of land out a number that we can fit into our budget that Panda approves that guy bent over backwards for us. And, and he, and he didn't even take the time to say, oh my God, they're getting like three bucks a plate, uh, you know, a, a hell of a deal. Uh, he's just like, uh, I, I think we need to cut that in half. What total irrational. I get it that he was supposed to manage Bob Carter's money, but we had set a, a, an approximate hundred grand a week, or it wasn't even that, but it ended up with that all in, uh, in Dallas. But as far as you know, we were at 75 grand a week or something like that is he wanted to get to 60 and we're just thinking he has no context of, he wanted to cut just to say he told Bob I cut. Right. It's so irrational. So why did you feel like that would be different with Dixie? Because Dixie uh, just had a better relationship with you guys. You thought her management approach was different. What can you Dixie tell? lived it. A, I mean, D Dixie was there on Wednesdays. She understood what it meant by a meet and three white trash cafe that we don't have to, I mean, it's, it's, you know, we, we certainly weren't asking for a five-star palm meal, but Hey, we got to feed these guys. They get to the venue at, you know, 11 o'clock and stay till nine o'clock. <clears throat> we got, we got to feed them. Um, Dixie is very personable. Have you met her in person yet? Conrad? Right. Yes. A few times. Okay. My bad. Uh, so, so, I mean, very personable, very personable. So when Sobel was let go, it was kind of a move that we thought, why didn't they do this from the beginning? Because again, I always thought 
from the day that she said, Hey, can you come to Dallas? My dad wants to hear all about this. That was, yes, that's her father, but in, in a business situation, that's investor relations. I always looked at her at that point of view is, but Bob wanted someone from his office in Dallas to come be the eyes and ears, not his daughter. Mm. So what was the unofficial, I mean, what, what was the title you think Chris Sobel had before Dixie replaces him? I know she's eventually going to be named president, but what was Chris? I always took, took Chris as a, a, you can call it a COO. Okay. I mean, chief operations. I mean, he, the buck stopped with him. Everything that every decision we made went from Nashville, whether it's a Bob Ryder airline ticket, or Jeff Jarrett, uh, you know, whatever it was, but we had a finite budget in those early days. He wasn't around long enough to see any growth. I mean, was he around three months, four months, five months, but every check written had to be approved by him. Very, very micromanaged. Very. So let's, let's do a quote from the observer. This is from, uh, April 14th. The behind the scenes situation with Jeff Jarrett versus Vince Russo is now more of a client deal. Russo's friends have gone to Dixie Carter, trying to push the idea that Jerry and Jeff are the problem because they interfere with Russo's idea, but it's not overt like in the past. Now I just want to take a time out here because we're not doing necessarily a Vince Russo episode, but I find it interesting that she's been with the comp around the company you know, for less than a year, because the company's less than a year old. Um, but she's only been important in this process, higher up, if you will, a decision maker and whatnot for a handful of months. And she's only replaced Chris for less than a month. And now Russo's going directly to her. Was that a red flag to you? Can you say that last question? I want to make you, I'm just, trying to get you messages. If so. there's a Russo, Jeff Jarrett impasse, so they're not getting along. That's what's written in the observer here. Right. It's also implied that Russo and his circle are approaching Dixie. It almost feels like they're trying to go over your head less than a month in. Was that a red flag to you? And you, you've got to help me out here because I, I'm, what I know now versus what I know then are completely two different stories. What did you know? What did you think you knew back then? What did I think I knew there right then is that I was the single largest single shareholder pandas, a company, and they were financed. It wasn't a Bob. It wasn't Dixie stock. It was Panda stock. And, and, and Pam is, so, you know, Panda is had 400 shareholders. You know, they're not a massive you know, uh, all this, but Bob ran the show, but he had a bunch of shareholders to report to. So as explained, so I'm the single largest shareholder founded the company and everything that went with it. And from the beginning, and we've gone on into this ad nauseum, there was a Jerry Jarrett philosophy and a Vince Russo philosophy. And later there was a Vince Russo philosophy and a Dutch Mantel philosophy and, and everything that kind of went with it. And so in the natural progression of the wrestling business that happens every day, all day on Twitter is once someone's around it, don't even have to be a month, a couple of weeks, they get inquisitive and start asking questions. When you ask questions, you immediately start forming opinions and the human mind quickly tells all of us we're not wrong we're right right so we you just don't ever think oh i'm not right i'm not right you know all that so in that whole psychology dixie i, I thought they were all having conversations my dad and dixie russo and russo and and, and dixie but th the thing was my dad and russo I'm out right fast because dixie probably feels like she's got to make a crash course in understanding wrestling you think she's been watching it on the outside, but now all of a sudden her family is heavily invested. She needs to learn as much as she can, as quick as she can about, that, about not just TNA, but other wrestling businesses, the way it was back in the day, what WWE does. 
And so I could understand her trying to learn as much as she can from everyone she can. Right. Can you imagine, uh, uh, Jesus, Conrad, can you imagine uh, there should be a movie about this, but no, like literally dropping into the wrestling industry yeah. in 2002 and no real clue because it's pre-internet. I mean, no real clue of how the is business existed just as recently as two or three years ago. You can hear about it, but anyway, and then all of a sudden that's your set point to start learning. I don't say it's impossibility, but nothing happens overnight. I mean, and, and you're not getting paid to learn. You're paying to learn. Oh, for your sure. Company's family fortune. And every week that goes by it's, I'm not uh, going to say six figures, but it's at least five figures every single week as you're learning on the job. And, and, and here's the compounding part of it that I had compassion for her then mm -hmm. and a lot more of dismissal that it's only, I, I knew it only takes time. Hell, I was told that I was Lawler and my dad and my grandmother and my grandfather, Eddie Marlin. Hey, bud, <laughs> it's him. Nothing re replaces experience when we'd work these spot shows and I'd have to wrestle three times. Hey, bud, nothing replaces experience. It's so true. So I just knew it's just going to kind of, kind of take some time. Um, but imagine hearing in left ear, Vince Russo and in the right ear, Jerry Jarrett, mm -hmm. you, you talk about a recipe for confusion because it's two opposing opinions mm -hmm. on the vision of the industry. So throw that into Dixie Carter's brain. It was mass confusion. I, and, and I, I, that's how I viewed it then. So now, you, didn't, you didn't perceive it as Vince Russo was necessarily trying to undermine you or going down. rule you. You just viewed it as, Hey, she's oh. seeking counsel from all she can. She's trying to drink water from a fire hydrant. As I like to say, trying to drink water from a fire hydrant, but I'd seen Vince for, for multiple years. You walk him into a dressing room. Vince Russo is going to gravitate to people that believe in his beliefs. Jared yeah. Jarrett walks into a dressing room. He's going to start talking wrestling to wrestlers and you know, whatever it may be, they just viewed things differently and that's how they gravitated. And so Dixie's job is to talk to everybody. And that was the thing about a PR. She, she didn't mind rolling up her sleeves and digging in and getting to work. <clears throat> wisdom teaches me now, but back then I'm like, ah, she'll be fine. She'll learn. But Conrad, I'm going back to the whole set point. They can talk amongst all they want. It's up to Jeff. It's on my shoulders to make the right decision. And I was under the belief that I, the buck did stop with me and I gladly took that spot and let's roll, you know, day to day, let's move. Well, we know things, they are going to be a changing, um, <laughs> the chain of command, as far as you understood it back then was you're the largest shareholder, but she, uh, now once she's named president, you view that as she's handling business, you're handling wrestling. What we've heard of those sort of like once upon a time, Eric would say on the WCW side of things, Oli was responsible for booking the wrestling. Sharon Sedillo was in charge of promotions and and pay-per-views and things like that. I ran TV. There was sort of, everybody had like their own division. Is that sort of the way you viewed it? Hey, Dixie's going to handle the business. I'm going to handle the wrestling piece or what was the chain of command for lack of a better word in your mind? So, and man, this, th in my brain, until the power play happened, and that's getting way down the line, I always viewed it as if I stay within Bob car, Bob Carter's comfort zone of managing the budget, if you will, that we set and that we talked about, then the chain of command was me to Bob Carter. I, I, it's, I go back to Janice's statement, Jeff, I don't care how you slice it and dice it. And I think at times she was, to, I know, I don't think I'm positive at times she wasn't saying the exact words, Hey Jeff, you don't worry about Chris Sobel. Hey Jeff, you don't worry about Dixie Carter. Yes. I said that, you know, you don't worry about a, B, C, and D. You don't worry about this. You worry about me and Bob. As long as you report to me and Bob on, on the budget, go do your thing. 
So what was Dixie overseeing at the time? I'm trying to drill down on, okay, she's here. She's in management. She's the quote unquote president. What if, if, if you think oh, yeah, yeah. it's you to Bob, what does Dixie have the ability to rule and reign over? We, what is our marketing spend? Okay. Uh, at the end of the day, it was how we go. I mean, uh, me and Dixie had a really, I mean, we did, we had a really good relationship because in my mind, creative and production and talent was, was like the three domains that were consumed and believe me that'll consume your day and dixie was brand awareness and marketing and how do we i mean continue to spread the word and basically impressions 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 early days it was impressions within demand how do we get them to help us market and advertise and do we go by 30 second spots in raw and what how do we pick and, and, and which, which Wednesdays, you know, what shows that, you know, we are in those early days, let's, we kind of decided, all right, let's take one Wednesday a month and let's focus on that's what we're promoting for the marketing uh, of the month. You know, the other Wednesdays were episodic and carrying the load, but let's not try to promote. We didn't have the budget week after week after week. Let's take one Wednesday per month and, and, you know, whether it's a cage match or, or whatever it may be, but promote that way or, or a surprise talent or something along those lines. Uh, that was the mindset. So to me, Dixie's top two jobs were a investor relationships. I was very grateful to this day. I'm very grateful that Bob, you know, took a, t took a leap of faith and, put up, st stepped up, and put his money up. And that's a big job that Dixie had because Panda always had a lot of questions. There was money going out and then I'll call it marketing and PR. And that is consuming as hell as when you have a small staff, it, I mean, you, you, and, and you're trying to, let's say by individual spots, let's just say 20 or 25 different markets, local markets, you know, by Memphis, by New York city, by LA, by Dallas. You know, you, it, it's a huge, it, it, it literally is a massive, huge account. So the, the marketing component, and again, we're, we're talking to, we'll, uh, we'll say a company as in trifecta that had zero clue about the wrestling industry, no less than X amount of days before this. Well, maybe you have zero clue about this, but Jeff and I are proud to tell you about a party in Nashville that you're invited to. Nashville's first of its kind live event is coming to the Woolworth theater and buddy, you've never seen anything like this before. Shiners is the hottest new show in Nashville that blends Cirque Broadway and comedy into one electrifying production located in downtown Nashville at the brand new Woolworth theater. Shiners has a star studded cast featuring Chuck Wicks and Laura Osnes, along with the most mind blowing talent from the Cirque world. You can catch a live Shiners performance at Woolworth Theater on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday nights. General admission and VIP tickets are on sale now at ShinersNashville.com or bring your whole crew and watch the show from your own VIP box. Enjoy some delicious signature cocktails and ice cold beer while you watch the show. You won't want to miss this if you live in or near Nashville or headed there soon for some fun of your own. Get your tickets today for shiners at shinersnashville.com. So let's talk about the Bowies. Uh, it's written here in the observer, uh, April 28th, those internally watching the dynamics, believe it will end up with Russo having more power when it comes to autonomy at some point, because both of Raven's influence with Dixie Carter and the belief that Russo was really the pandas people's choice for writing from the beginning, because he'll fight for it. And Jerry Jarrett won't. So a lot to unpack there, pal. Let's work backwards. Did you have a read on how the Panda people understood your father or respected your father? Did they have any idea what his legacy and history in pro wrestling was, or was it, was he for lack of a better word, Jeff's dad? Lack of a better word, Jeff's dad, but th that's probably not accurate either. It, it is uh, a longtime wrestling promoter, but zero clue of the history. None. 
you so, know. So how did they view him? Was he just Jeff's dad and he's just a no, guy? No, 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 no. It was Jeff and Jerry that started this. Got it. Yeah, yeah. It, partners. So now that we understand that, it's written here was really uh, that Russo was really people's pandas or pandas people's choice for writing from the beginning because he'll fight for it. Did they believe, do you believe that they believed? Follow me here. That Russo was more passionate about the company than maybe Jerry was that Jerry had made his fortune. He was maybe in the, the sunset of life and he's just trying to come along to get along or whatever the phrases are. Whereas maybe Russo was more full of piss and vinegar to use a phrase. No, they didn't believe that okay. in my, at, at all that, that, you know, again, I had individual relationships. It wasn't like, like a relation had, had a relationship. I wouldn't put them in the same, you know, Bob and Janice. It's I had a relationship with Bob, I had a relationship with Janice, I had a relationship with Dixie, I had a relationship with Todd. And then there were, you know, in the early days, Steve Rosieri's an attorney and uh, Steve Campbell and, and all, all, all the individuals Panda wasn't just one blanket answer. You, you, it was a diverse, very diverse at times opinions and thoughts and everything that went with it. And it was kind of fascinating at this stage. I was learning as I, as I went, but my dad took the position or how I viewed it was, you know, Russo's over there selling his, pants off he doesn't really have to jeff's kind of made a statement he wants vince a part of the 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 um team and when dixie would go to inquiring answers and wanting to know you know and yes the red lights there's so many red lights when i look back on everything now but at the time it was that's vince he, he's just selling he's selling his ideas and concepts but i'm telling you vince would sell a Jerry Lynn, you know, Jerry Lynn may, and I'm just using this as a hypothetical, you know, J Jerry Lynn ha had a, you know, a wrestling mindset on whatever it may be, A, B, and C. And Vince is like, bro, no, you know, let's do it the sports entertainment or let's do it the WWF way or all this, you know, it was Vince very headstrong. He, he saw the business, how he just came off of in the, late nineties and didn't really see it any other way. Let's talk about Raven. He's mentioned here Raven's influence. Now there's been lots of stories over the years. We don't have to get into them that I'm sure we will eventually, but down in Orlando guys would start to get in Dixie's ear and become quote unquote Dixie's favorite or quote unquote Dixie's pet project. And I think that's probably natural, uh, in, in not just in wrestling, but in, uh, in business, people like to buddy up to whoever the boss is. And they feel like that's how they get job security, or maybe they get a raise or they get advancement or whatever. Was Raven one of the first to figure out, Hey man, uh, if this lady, uh, has a little influence, maybe I can butter her up and, and get myself a good place. Or was he out of the goodness of his heart saying, okay, she wants to learn about wrestling. I'll help coach her up. What was Raven's deal here? I'm hindsight's 2020. Obviously I didn't know it at the time, but in hindsight, Raven was Dixie's first favorite. Got it. J just that simple. And look, oh, Scotty been around. Yeah. He Scotty, the body, even in the Memphis territory and whatever a late eighties. Yeah. So Raven had been around and been around. He, he knew. He knew the game. Um, do you think at the time now with the benefit of hindsight that Russo was trying to create some inroads to gain some more political power or was it not really that complex at the time or now with the benefit of hindsight with the benefit of hindsight? Absolutely. Yeah. And the facts just add up. I mean. From day one, literally from day one, he was I mean, in the different stories of j just all it's 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 no hypotheticals anymore. He wanted to be attached to the money. Yeah. 
Here's a quote from the observer. A lot of talk regarded Raven and Jarrett. The big story after the show almost every week is Raven and Russo on one side and Jarrett on the other, trying to convince Dixie Carter, the daughter of the owner, that their ideas are better and trying to rally as many people behind their respective sides and talking with her. Russo's side turns in a show on Thursday and complains that Jarrett doesn't come back with any changes until Tuesday, late at night. By that point, Russo is too tired to argue with him. Now, this is something that even if it's true, how does this get in the observer? Is this really the first time you start to think, man, we got some loose lips around these parts. We've got to tighten up the act a little bit. I mean, as far as loose lips, I, I have, you know, shit, I've been around it forever. There's always going to be leaks. Yeah. It just, it's just the nature of, you know, telephone, telegraph, tele wrestler. I guess my, my next question is if you know, there's leaks and you know that these guys seemingly, well, let me ask, is this true? Do you remember finding yourself where it's like after the show, there would be some sort of post-show glow or discussion, whether it's that night, the following couple of days, here's what we thought we should do more of this, maybe less of that. Here's what worked. Here's what didn't. I don't know if politicking is the right term, but the nature of the beast is whether it was Saturday morning in Memphis or whether it was raw or SmackDown or nitro or thunder or TNA Wednesday pay-per-view you go put the show on after the show, everybody picks it apart either positively or negatively. It's the nature of the beast. Oh, this worked. This didn't work. This worked. This didn't work. I always welcome that. What do y'all really think about this? I never gave it a second thought that, Hey, give me your feedback. Vince Russo knew again, hindsight, it's going to be the benefit, but at the time I'm viewing it through Vince knows the buck stops with me. So I don't really care if he doesn't like, I don't have, if I don't respond to him till Tuesday or Monday or Sunday. He's the one that would continue to bitch about that. Now, you know, now all the water under the bridge, but boy, you got to talk about an unhappy person. <laughs> Just crazy. But anyhow, I, I guess my question is, you know, you just, you just felt like it was harmless. I mean, cause it feels like part of me would say, Jeff, why don't you just nip this in the bud? If oh, I thought it's harmless. You, you hit it. Hey, it's talk. It's chatter. Okay. So, uh, let's talk about this. Okay, just, let's, let me back up. I despised witnessing folks with just yes men around them. I, I, you know, you read any book, it, it'll get you in trouble in this business. You, you still do. Yeah. I've, I've seen you, uh, yeah, a few times in that regard. <laughs> uh, we'll talk about that off air. Um, let, let, let's, let's, talk, that. let's talk about Dixie for a minute. What is your day to day or week to week experience with her? Like, because I mean, again, we're talking about very early on, this is Oh three. Yep. Uh, so surely she's at the shows. We, we got that. Those are on Wednesday. We're doing weekly pay-per-view. Got it. But like the other days of the week, is she someone you're in daily contact with? You guys exchange emails. You're on the phone. Just what is your working relationship like? I mean, this like one, one PW and I'm just trying to think of different independent shows that might go on on the weekend. So I might be out of the office on Fridays where I'm going with it, but I'm at coming station in Nashville every day outside of Wednesdays and whatever it may be. Um, we did our post-production, um, you know, no, we were doing live every Wednesday, but we did, you know, spots and we, we did our production stuff over on music row, which was two blocks, uh, if you will, uh, from, um, the, the office, but yes. So to say, I wasn't, I was in, we'll call it daily communication with Dixie and the entire team. Yeah. It's just, that was the nature of the beast and what's coming up. And in the phone was attached to my hip. I mean, to my ear all the time. All, yeah. Here's a big story in early 2004. 
There's rumblings coming out of Nashville last week that Dixie Carter has grown frustrated with the uninspired booking of her family's promotion. Rumors were flying that the Carters held a ball busting meeting to complain that there was nothing quote unquote cutting edge about the TNA product. Assuming there's something to those rumors, good for Mrs. Carter. It's about time someone in that company's management acknowledges just how mediocre the last few months of TNA have been. The TNA pay-per-views have become non-events. There's just nothing special about these shows to justify anyone paying $10 a week. In fact, some of these shows wouldn't have made the grade they'd been presented as free television shows on WGN. A fan at a recent TNA show held up a sign that served as a fair assessment of TNA events over the last few months. Smells like WCW. Some TNA shows have been better than others, but more often than not, TNA pay-per-views are painfully boring and uninspired. There's just nothing innovative about the product. And it's very rare that the company produces a storyline or an angle strong enough to entice viewers to pay another pen, 10 bucks to tune in the following week. All of that said, it's good to hear that Carter has committed to giving Jeff Jarrett the time he needs to implement his booking plans. The latest booking team of Jarrett and Dutch Mantel hasn't had enough time to jail and Mantel's track record suggests that he is the right man for the job. However, that shouldn't stop Carter from privately compiling a list of fallback plans. Even if TNA secures its television, video game, and action figure deals, the company will not survive if the booking continues to be this lackluster. Jarrett and Mantell do deserve a reasonable amount of time to implement their plans, but Carter must also be prepared if the time comes when she has to say enough is enough. So first off, Jeff, Wade's pretty hard on you here, but this is the first mention of her having any sort of negative input. It's described as ball busting. Uh, I'm not, well, let me just ask first, before we break all this down, were you reading the observer or torch was your dad? Were you hearing about it? Or are you oblivious to all this? I'm oblivious. I mean, I'm not saying that I never wrote it, but I wasn't a weekly reader at all. When I something like this comes up, oh, they said she had a ball, ball busting meeting. Does anybody in the office say anything about it? Or is it just not even brought up or discussed? Not even brought up or discussed, but because Dixie could say, and I'll say this diplomatically, she could come out with a ball busting comment at any time and not being mean spirited. Just now, why would, you know, let me think of it. You know, why would that be in the main event that did, you know, whatever it mean, everybody has the right to ask all kinds of opinion opinions, but I don't recall like a big ball busting meeting uh, again, it's blurring the lines and Wade and Dave and Jason Powell and any wrestling journalist, that's kind of their job is to take something with the foundation of truth, but make it sexy and collect bait or good to read or fun to read or enticing or something to make you want to come back and read next week's newsletter. Right. Uh, I don't remember any ball busting, you know, meeting, but Dixie was critical and would praise like, oh, wow, that would be, you know, whatever it is that happened all the time. What was your, you know, we're bouncing around a little bit here. Uh, what was your first impasse with Dixie? Do you remember there being a business thing where she was firmly on one side and you were firmly on the other? When did it like, listen, when I was putting together Ric Flair's last match, I would reach out and say, Hey Jeff, what about this? Hey Jeff, what about that? I don't remember us ever getting to a spot where you felt strongly one way and I felt strongly another, and there was an impasse, but I'm sure that had to exist in your relationship with Dixie. Cause our event was a one-off. This is a weekly thing here. Do you right. remember the first like major disagreement where it's like, she just felt really strong. I'm not saying it got ugly. I'm not saying there was name calling, but yeah. she wanted to do this and you wanted to do that. And you both felt strongly. Hmm. That's a good question. Um, Lots of little things like you're kind of like we're, we're talking about whatever it may be. Um, and when it got into marketing and advertising, Conrad, that was budget driven so strongly. And so if she wanted to do Knoxville, Birmingham, and 
Indianapolis and I wanted to do Wichita and Minneapolis and Chicago, whatever it is, that's like, Hey, th- I defer to you. You're going to have more research on this. It's all that from a creative perspective, we might've had ups and downs and Hey, this and that I always gave her, I'll call it the benefit of the doubt. Like Dixie, I understand that's why you feel so strongly, but a, I know where I've been going. I mean, where, where I'm coming from and where I'm going, this may not make sense, but again, and I don't, I bet she's heard me say, I mean, 10,000 times, maybe more Dixie creative is subjective. Yes. No, you don't like to hear that, but there's no such thing as an absolute right and an absolute wrong for the most part. Cause you can make anything happen. This guy wins, this guy loses. You can flip the shoe and do it just the opposite almost in every set of circumstances. But with all that being said, let me, let me I, comment out right there. Was that frustrating have, for her dad? Was that frustrating for her dad? That creative is so subjective. I ask because yeah, okay. they're from a traditional. Oh, oh no, but buddy, I'm going to build a power plant and I'm going to know every month how much energy that I create and I can sell. But that's there, pretty easy. Like there's only one way by and large. There's yeah, one yeah. way for a plumber to do his job. There's one way for an electrician to yes. do his job. And that's the way that the code says, and here's what you're supposed to do, but there is no supposed to do in pro wrestling creative, right? Well, I always would, and, cause Dixie had a background in music. So, so they, they, but anybody can kind of understand this. You get in a car and the radio's on. So you understand. And, and I would always come up with different scenarios in I, what makes a great movie. Is it De Niro or, or is it the story De Niro's in, or is it the supporting actor that stole these, you know, all the different variables and what makes your Dallas Cowboys, you know, they're coming off those Super Bowl wins. Is that Jimmy Johnson? Well, they uh, Barry Switzer won with almost the exact same team. You know, I would try to come up with relevant analogies that it's just so, so hard. And then the simplest one is what makes a number one hit song or the singer. And, you know, me and you right now could land on, oh, Jeff, damn it. You know, you, you, you believe it's absolutely the song, because if you have the right song, anybody can sing and come hit. And then you can say, well, I don't know, Taylor Swift, she had number one after number one, after number one, and she's the one. Then we both can be wrong. Cause you can say, Hey, without the timing, without the stream, without the marketing, without the promotion, without this guy, not not having an album out and this guy, not all the timing, timing, timing. So there's, it is subjective over and over and over, but Bob got that. Okay. We had such a good relationship in that as an investor investee, just that like Bob, I wish I could give you a blue, uh, just a black and white answer. That ain't the business we're in. Let me ask about the cutting edge line. When I read TNA's not that Dixie's saying we're not cutting edge enough. Boy, that sounds like we got Russo in her ear. Does it not? I was going to say, if you want me to answer the question just a second ago, when was the first impasse? Uh, but I would, he, he, th- th- this is a kind of a frustration point. When I would hear certain phrases come out of Dixie's mouth. If I heard it one time, mm, little antenna went up on the Richter scale, right? Heard it a second time, heard it a third time. And what human nature, I'm not going to put it on just Dixie or Dixie and Vince, but it, it, it's, it's the open lines of communication. And then I'm on a phone call with Russo and I hear that same phrase. Yes. Once said twice said, Oh, Okay. I got it. Yes. I, I got it. It, it. It's that kind of simple, but I also never, that never got my feathers ruffled. It, it is what it is. Hey, it is what it is. And, and you know, you go around trying to please everybody, you piss everybody off. That lesson taught to me early in business, like really early in business. I, I mean that it's a death nail. You know that Conrad and because and, you've run business, but it, it is such a death nail when you try to make everybody happy. Can't you do piss it. Off, you make everybody mad. So the first impasse, it sounded like you remembered something and you had a story you were going to go with. Because this, 
this has come from, if you're a long time, my world listener, you'll kind of know where with this, because we've covered the early days of TNA. We've covered individual episodes. We've covered certain pay-per-view uh, events and all that go with that. But the thing that, now again, hindsight popping out when we'll call it the Russo Kurt Alliance and Dixie really, whatever the, that, that was going on. And Kurt was really pushing. I knew that Dixie, you are, this investment that your father made in Kurt Angle, and he is the, the, the I mean, the heart and soul of everything we have going on right now. Right. And you're going to have him take the ball, his eye off the ball. I, I just said, Dixie, Kurt is our main event wrestler. He's not a booker. He's not a writer. He's damn sure not talent relations. He's none of the above. We hired him to lead the charge. Nothing more, nothing less. Is it a super important job? Yes. You have him doing other jobs. It's a death nail. And we, we butted head. Of, that was the first real big. Well, so, no. I, so it was years well, later before. Oh, that's what I'm saying is yes. That was where I was going with the, with the point that we're, we're getting. Yes. Me and Dixie had a healthy business relationship. Was it perfect? Hell no. But I'm going to go back to this. We were not making a profit right. until the spike. So it was super challenging for her. I mean, really challenging for her. And this run of, oh, we're not edgy enough. We're not this and that. Hell, I would have jumped up on the table, and I'm sure I did in different ways, and said, Dixie, I agree. Bring it. Where's our budget? How can we create pop culture moments? How can we do this? How can we do that? And, and I'm all ears. You can look at the shows and see that we tried all kinds of things. Yes, you did. Including, and we've talked about a lot of them. <laughs> yes. So listen, let's, um, you know, we're talking about money and, 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 and she is making a significant investment. Was there ever a point where you or your dad, like in this, we'll call it the first 12 months or the first year and a half. Yeah. You thought, man, I regret doing this or was it, was it always, boy, I'm so glad they did it and we'll overcome all the other stuff. So we went into those early stage, uh, those, those other episodes, but you know, I'll say in, in, in my last five years, this has crystallized more and more and more and more when we knew that they weren't really happy, really happy that there was a lot of unrest in Dallas and Dixie was, you know, either wanting more control. Again, this is all hindsight 2020. She's wanting more control and wanting more say so. And Bob saying we hired Jeff or we partnered with Jeff. He's running the wrestling and maybe him back in who knows what those conversations were that Bob trying to back Dixie off and all this. But when we knew that, okay, we probably, you know, don't want to have a Richard's Crucy situation. So me and my father, we went and found an option gentlemen in the mortgage business. It's ironic, but in the mortgage business, when we brought him to the table and he literally was ready to start writing checks, keep the Carters in reduced to a minority position. But when he stepped up to the plate and Bob didn't just say no, he disrespected that gentleman in the organization to the point that it scorched earth. Hmm. I knew they're in. What time? What, 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 what timeline are we on there? Is that Oh four? Is that Oh five? Is that later? Five. Oh five. Before spike. Well, before spike in Oh four, early five. Well, listen, I mean, what we're talking about is trying to save money and, uh, we've all seen how hard it is to cancel a subscription, or maybe you're forgetting to cancel a subscription. I recently ended a 25 year relationship with direct TV. I've cut the cord. I'm now doing YouTube TV, but what it made me motivated to do is, I mean, I took a look at the bill and I realized, uh, 
I'm paying a lot more than I'm actually getting my money's worth. So then I decided, Hey, you know what? Hey, true bill has something like that. And that's why I love using rocket money. We used to know them as true bill. I want to ask you a question. Are you wasting money on subscriptions? Well, 80% of folks have subscriptions. They forgot about maybe it's your unused Amazon prime account, or maybe a Hulu account that never gets streamed. Well, this is a great app that I use that helps me track all of my expenses. And because of it, I no longer waste money on subscriptions. I don't even use, you might've heard of it. We used to know it is true bill these days. It's called rocket money. Let me ask you a question. Do you know how much money your subscriptions really cost? Well, most Americans think they spend around 80 bucks a month on subscriptions. In actuality, it's closer to $200 and up. That's right. You could be wasting hundreds of dollars each and every month on subscriptions. You don't even know about this app shows you all the subscriptions in one place, and then it cancels for you, whatever you don't still want. Rocket money can even find subscriptions. You didn't even know you were paying for. You may even find out you've been double charged for a subscription to cancel a subscription. All you have to do is press cancel and rocket money takes care of the rest. Get rid of useless subscriptions with rocket money. Now go to rocketmoney.com slash my world. Seriously. It could save you hundreds per year. That's rocketmoney.com slash my world. Cancel your unnecessary subscriptions right now at rocketmoney.com slash my world. So let's fast forward to, uh, a torch report from August of Oh four. Observers say that while Dixie Carter and Jeff Jarrett have had their share of disagreements in recent weeks, there's no sign that their relationship has fallen apart. Wrestlers say it appears to them that TNA upper management keeps Dixie quote unquote, very well insulated from criticism. And even when Dixie lets them know she doesn't care for one of the shows, she's quickly reminded she doesn't understand the wrestling business as well as the Jarrett's and other officials do. More than one wrestler has countered that claim by pointing out that while Dixie may not have much experience in the business, as some of her employees do, she's a wrestling fan and her views on the booking isn't that far off from how fans see the show. So let's just take a time out right there because I think this brings up an interesting point. There's a whole lot of folks who watch online and are often critical of things they see on TV. And say, oh, I didn't like this. Oh, I didn't like that. And I'm sure that guys like Bruce Pritchard, who pour their heart into wrestling creative, can at times maybe dismiss that and say, well, they don't understand. But on the other hand, if they are your fans, and if we're watching a regular television show, like let's say White Lotus, which just came back on HBO and the wife and I love, and it's fantastic. If at the end of an episode, we're like, Man, I don't really like these stories. This isn't. This isn't as good as it was last season. I am less likely to maybe keep watching the show. Is it a slippery slope? Is it hard to not get too big for your britches as somebody who's been in the wrestling business for a long time? Or are you still keenly aware of that viewer criticism? It's without question, maybe the most slippery, is that right? Uh, grammar. Yeah. Most slippery slope there is in the industry. Yeah, it, it is. It, but he, here's something that I think wisdom teaches. Uh, you know, guys that are going to a studio, sit behind a mixing board. Those guys got an ear that they yeah. hear notes that most folks don't even have a clue that that note was on or off or whatever it may be is. So Conrad. I don't think there's anybody in the world that doubts. I mean, not even a sliver of a doubt that you're a wrestling fan. No, oh, no, for sure. I mean, you, you, because, oh, the gold, I mean, you tell me different things about history, but I'm not, I'm, I'm talking about just in, in the country. You're a fan. Yeah. But you, okay. You start asking me questions questions you'll find out real quick whether i'm a fan of football basketball baseball or hockey yes i love sports but you're kind of gonna you're, you're gonna know yeah 
that is something that is, I think, comes with wisdom. Now, is this guy, is this consumer, it, 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 are they just kind of chirping or do they have a valid point? Now, again, that's subjective. So it gets a slippery slope, but the coming from a positioning of, do I want a bitch? Am I just being a parent and echoing what, what I think I'm hearing uh, th this group over here say, is this a, a legitimate mindset or you know what? They're not even a consumer to begin with. They literally, now you can watch an episode on TV, but are you really a consumer? Are you going to watch a premium live event? Are you going to buy a t-shirt? When it comes to town, are you actually going to go out and watch and spend money on it? To me, there's a huge difference between a viewer and a consumer. There just is. And there always has been. Now, identifying that is the difficult part. Even more difficult, perhaps is to have someone who admittedly doesn't know much about this business and comes to you, maybe the person who wrote the show and expresses that they didn't like the show. Cause now, as you, you said, it is a slippery slope on the one hand, there's the pride of ownership of, Hey, well, this was my idea. I, I like it dot, dot, dot. And I have 20, 30 years of history to explain why I like it and you as a fan just don't get it because you're not as big of a fan as this, as I am, you don't have the experience that I do, but you don't want to just quickly dismiss it because well, you're writing the checks. <laughs> so it's weird to, to have this sort of impasse. And I'm sure that a lot of people who worked for Vince McMahon once upon a time felt the same way. Like. They're full-time writing on this show. And allegedly we would hear there would be blow-ups about they don't know what they're doing. And they could think, well, I have consumed every bit of this and wrote every piece of verbiage and da, 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 da. I'm intimately aware, but he's kind of my boss. So <laughs> it's hard to argue. And, and you, and now I'm not saying I'm not even for a minute comparing Dixie Carter's approach and Vince McMahon's, but you are in a weird spot here. Are you not? Oh. Over and over and over. And I, and I just, this is where the reality, maybe some sympathy thrown in there too, is, is that her set point was not watching wrestling beforehand at all. Right. The, the learning curve is su super short and, and the learning curve of WWE looking from the outside in, and we'll call it little old Wednesday night TNA. It, it, it's just really, really difficult. And then all of a sudden you can go to a show and if you go to a two hour Wednesday night pay-per-view by design, I wanted to come out red hot. I mean, yay. I mean, on fire that viewer that just bought 10 bucks. I want to want them to have a good feeling like, hell yeah, I'm glad I bought this knowing that you can't have 120 minutes of nonstop people standing on their feet, screaming for 120 minutes. So you got to bring them down like a symphony, a little bit like a roller coaster ride, knowing that you have to bring them down at certain spots to get them ready to go through that valley. Cause without valleys, there are no mountains, no peaks, I uh, should say. So knowing all that, but then all of a sudden you take somebody and, and, and see this certain talent that's in the opening match three weeks in a row and they, people are standing on their seats week after week. You go, well, why aren't they, why aren't they in the main event? Look at the people during every one of their matches. They're screaming. Well, that's kind of by design. That's kind of the match they were put in. Well, this guy's in the, you know, they're, they're kind of down this week and maybe down the next week. Oh, they're terrible. It, it's all, there's so much that goes in to create, create the creative process that is subjective and is timing. But then what you just said, then you go back and you have Russo's camp, and Jerry Jarrett's camp or Dutch Mantel's camp or Jeremy Borash's camp, or maybe D Dallas that the, they're out in, uh, out in Dallas, the Panda camp, everybody inputting into Dixie's mind. And then she has to create an output. Super confusing, super, super confusing. Let's talk about something that's written in the torch, October 1st, 2004. 
The anti-Jira and Dutch Mantel sentiment continues to grow in the locker room. Wrestlers resent the fact that Jared is pushing himself as the centerpiece of the promotion and even more so that he continues to treat them as if they should feel indebted to the company for booking them quote, Dixie has to get rid of the biggest problem, which is Jeff. The wrestler said others have pointed that even top wrestlers with the best contracts are miserable. America's most wanted have been complaining about their pushes for weeks. And even AJ styles is said to be unhappy with the company's direction. The timing may be right for Kevin Nash or anyone else to pull a power play. As observers say, Dixie Carter is clearly frustrated with the direction that Jarrett and Mantell have taken the company. Sources say the ratings for impact have decreased significantly over the last few weeks. They're on Fox sports South at this point, Jarrett and Mantell are using the excuse that the show and upcoming pay-per-view are not receiving enough advertising from the company. They also attribute the ratings drop to kids returning to school, taking away a large portion of their audience. So this is really when you start to hear some of the boo birds come out and some of the anti Jeff sentiment, it certainly started to grow and continue to build and compound. And I'm sure that was a lot of guys like talent in the locker room communicating with the torch, but did you think that it was some folks you shared offices with as well, who were pushing in that direction to try to get this narrative out through the quote unquote dirt sheets. So we're in Oh five, right? About Oh five. Oh four end of Oh four, October of Oh four. So, but so Dixie had been around the business two and a half years or a little over two years. So, so her getting into the minutia and the details and the whys and the opinions created a culture is what, kind of where I'm going with the, there came a time. Yeah. We're probably right in it. Those Fox sports days that it became in vogue in the office. Let's just rip the hell out of the program, but not really come up with any suggestions, solutions. What's wrong with it? Yeah. Complaining is not a strategy. But I, I'll say this, Dixie created that culture without question, because I would ask around, I'm like, now what's kind of the context of all this? Well, she wants to know, she doesn't want to hear rosy reports, you know, and blah, 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 blah. And I'm thinking now it wasn't just two weeks ago or whenever the timeline was Fox sports executives, Fox sports South. Is where, you know, my bad. Fox Sports, uh, again, it's not the Fox Sports we know today, but we were on Friday afternoons on all the regionals around the country. We were getting numbers on a Friday afternoon that they were going, we have no idea really how you're creating this success, but it's doing great on Friday afternoons. Not all the time, but, and then how quickly, oh, look at our numbers this week, you know, living and dying on a week to week basis, which will kill you. And, wait, didn't the kids go back in school and Friday night football or whatever it is, it just kind of the ebbs and flows of the seasons and, and all that. But that culture was created, drove me crazy at times, but, um, it, it kind of, it became the thing and Dutch, you know, Dutch would come to me super frustrated sometimes like, they got a thousand reasons that they think the show sucks, but I hadn't heard one suggestion yeah. that somebody's going to put their name on. They'll put their name on criticism, but they won't put their name on uh, a suggestion to make it better. November 5th, another report from the torch Dixie Carter was backstage for the first time in a couple of weeks at last week's taping. She missed the previous week's show because she was on a business trip in Mexico. Her appearance led to a humorous situation with Johnny Fairplay. Dixie is clearly Fairplay's biggest advocate in the company, so much so the creative team books the former Survivor star simply to appease her. Because Dixie was in attendance, Fairplay was booked for a late segment in the show. However, Dixie left the building before the show ended, and when the creative team realized she was gone, they decided to pull Fairplay from the show. Uh, I love Johnny Fairplay. He is a character and a half in real life too. <laughs> yes. Is this a real story? Hey, she wanted him on there, but when we realized she was out of the building, we pulled him off. 
Is that? Hell no. <laughs> no. I mean, like, like that tape's just going to, I mean, come on. Oh, hey. So Dixie. She yeah. So she'll never see or hear about it. Yeah. What? Really. But I, I don't want to lose sight of the fact it made for some great journalistic writing. Uh, it's a couple of weeks later, November 19th, in a reaction to continued rumors, including torch reports of dissension between Jerry and Jeff Jarrett and Dixie Carter. They all had a long talk at this Tuesday's TV taping. It is unusual to see Jeff meet with Dixie or Jerry meet with Dixie, but it is unusual for all three to meet together at once. The discussion lasted well over an hour. Carter also had a long talk with other office workers perhaps in part trying to figure out the source of the rumors about political infighting in TNA. One source said, quote, Dixie wants someone fired over this controversy. Uh, let's fast forward a week later, the meeting Dixie Carter held with the Jarrett's prior to the impact tapings on November 16th was held in the open yet far enough away from the wrestlers that it was considered a private meeting. Dixie who sided with Jeff and the dispute between him, him and his father was believed to be doing her best to make peace between the two observers said the meeting appeared to be cordial as all parties took turns talking and no one visibly lost their temper. Is this accurate in late Oh four Dixie found herself trying to play peacemaker between you and your dad. She did that on, I don't say a number of occasions, but yeah, she did. She, she, that was, that definitely happened a couple of times. Um, there kind of during this time frame, th there were as far as an investment blooms off, off the rose. It, it just, th that's the natural progression. And then Dixie getting in and, and asking certain questions. And then, you know, Dixie, like anybody, they don't like negative stuff written uh, about themselves ever. But in the early days, the first time you see something nasty written about you, it really stinks you kind of des desensitize your you know, being around the industry for years and years and years, but early it was, Oh wait, now all of a sudden, then all of a sudden that factors in that you're, you're, you know, Dixie is catering to Dallas. She's catering to, we'll call it the people, you know, on staff and talent. And then all of a sudden now you got to start catering to this unknown third party of, you know, make sure that I'm positioned right in social media you kind of get yourself in that tangled web and it's a drain. I mean, like proverbial, you, you start to get flushed down a drain because you cannot survive back to what we said 30 minutes ago. When you're trying to start, please everybody. It, it is a death knoll. What, what was, we're going to go ahead and put a button on this for now. There's no way we can cover all that is Dixie oh, Carter. Yeah. But I do want to ask, you know, because listen, there's been, and I said this a couple of weeks ago, I want to say it again. Now I know that we're, we're sitting here just talking about, you know, one side of the events. And we are talking about Dixie Carter, trying to learn wrestling and figure out how to do more and blah, blah, blah. And I don't know why, but there's always been this real negative tone online amongst hardcore wrestling fans. Whenever they talk about Dixie. And I think those folks or maybe short-sighted. And I hate that it feels like it's happening again with, with Tony Khan. And because I'm friendly with Tony Khan in real life, people think that, you know, I'm an AEW apologist or whatever other bullshit. Now here's what I am. I'm a wrestling fan. And I like when the wrestling business gets bigger. I don't think it's good for fans or the people who work in the business when it gets smaller. And I wonder, would any of us be talking about AJ styles? Would he be a millionaire? Would he be WWE champion? Would he be who we know him now? without a platform like TNA to make it happen. I don't think the answer to that is yes. And I know you could argue, well, eventually they were going to cut his contract and he had to go to new Japan and blah, 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 but he honed his craft somewhere and got paid pretty well, a long time to do it. And it was directly out of the Carter's pocketbooks. I'm not picking on AJ. I'm just saying there's a whole lot of talent that we as fans got to enjoy a lot of great matches and, and listen, maybe you could look and poke holes and say, well, it wasn't all that good. Okay. Would it be better if it never existed? Would wrestling be better if TNA didn't exist? No. Would wrestling be better if AW didn't exist? No. We would be back to just a one horse race. And that's not as fun. No matter what you think of how everybody 
booked this or what they paid that guy or what the ratings were. There's a handful of people who really put their money where their mouth is in professional wrestling. And Dixie Carter is one of them. I don't know why people don't talk about that, but I'm glad we got to talk about it today. And I wanted to ask you, because listen, people are going to poke holes in all of Dixie's weaknesses. Well, she did this. Well, she did that. What were some of Dixie's strengths as somebody who was in the trenches with you in these early years, because to see that, man, you're at an impasse now with your dad, maybe, and maybe there's some business, maybe there's some creative, maybe there's some personal and there's a lot of folks who listen to this, who didn't always get along swimmingly with their parents. And now all of a sudden Dixie finds herself thrust in the middle of that and paying for the right to do it. Like Dixie doesn't get near the credit she deserves. So just as we close our show, give us some strengths that she brought to the table and here in, you know, Oh three, Oh four. And you know, we, me and you have talked about this long before, not this week or even last week, or, you know, we're talking maybe day one on my world. And I, we both kind of shared, I said, I think the topic of the individual topic of Dixie Carter will come at the right time. We'll cover the early days and this and that. But when you look at the history from, well, I don't want to go in the late eighties, but you know, from 2002 up till 2013, my time in TNA, Jeff and Dixie are synonymous in so many ways. And, and, and I don't think that we could have uh, 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 achieved the profitability. Uh, just so many things went hand in hand. And so you asked me her strengths. I, I think it's, it's the, it, I know this is the most low hanging fruit that there is, but, and we're touching on misguided and a, looking through a Russo lens or throw all that out the window. <clears throat> Dixie, like myself, super passionate. She wanted to win. Yes. I, I mean, I think you just have to put that at the very, very, very tip top. She wanted to win. Also, Chris Sobel came to town. This is appropriate for this, th this episode, but also to the answer to this question, Chris Sobel came to town with nothing but vinegar. It, th there was never any happiness, never any joy, never any, Hey, let me understand. Hey, just, he came with Michelle. Exactly, man. Yeah, but, but, but. I look, Conrad, you've been a hatchet man in your life. And I have too. There's ways to do it that you go, Hey, Vince McMahon has in a lot of ways made himself a billionaire off of knowing when to be a hatchet man, mm -hmm. it's just part of the job. But Dixie came with compassion, in my opinion, sometimes too much that it just didn't mix. And you tried to make everybody happy. But her joy and positivity and hell, one of the best spins. I mean, hey, she spun stories to her family sometimes that, hey, I don't think the investor needs to know all the ugliness going on up here. And I'm not talking about nothing, but just, you know, just the investor. So her positivity, her ability to, 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 I'll say spin a story. That's that it's, it, it, it's, it's, it, it takes talent. It's craft, but her passion and will to win, I think up rank up right up there at the very, very top. I mean, we could get into business acumen that, that she had a mindset and look, like I said, she's managed major country music stars, major accounts. So all the, the, the positives of her business, uh, you know, side of that, and maybe her non-creative ability, she just didn't have a skill set or, or that that throw all that out the window. Her will to win to me, probably, and I've never be, even been asked that, Conrad. That to me is her strongest skill set. Well, there you go, boys and girls. I uh, I hope you've enjoyed a stroll down memory lane today as we talked about all things Dixie Carter. I want to remind you uh that we've got a lot of really fun stuff coming up in the future. We've got tons of more Dixie Carter content coming your way. Uh, we, we never got to questions. We're probably going to do hours of questions on Dixie from you guys. You can ask us a question anytime you'd like 
over at my world pod on Twitter coming up next week here on the program. We're going to be talking about Genesis 2007. Uh, mm. we're, going to, we're going to take a look at that. And then, uh, in three weeks, we'll be back talking about ring King, uh, which is one of our most requested topics in two weeks. We'll talk about you winning the NWA title pretty early on. I think it was the 21st episode. We'll round wow. out the month of November talking about Dutch Mantel. Lots of interesting stuff in the hopper here on my world, including some changes. I think you're really going to dig, uh, throw us a like, hit the subscribe button, leave us a five-star review. If you think we've earned it, don't forget to follow us on Twitter. One more time. It's at my world pod. He is at real Jeff Jarrett. I am Matt. Hey, Hey, it's Conrad. The easiest way to introduce a new listener to the program. Cause sometimes our shows go two hours or more. Show them some bite-sized clips over on YouTube. It's youtube.com forward slash my world with Jeff Jarrett. You want to hit the like and subscribe button and turn the notifications bell on. And here's a notification for you right now. Adfreeshows.com has a ton of new content. We just did a title chase about the WCW world title that Ron Simmons made famous with the protege of Reggie parks on the one year anniversary of his passing. We also sat down with Jeff and Karen to talk about Tripla as we recap some fun AAA memories, especially around triple mania, Jake Roberts, right in time for Halloween sat down to watch Halloween Havoc 1992 from 30 years ago, started his swan song in WCW, and you got to ask him questions live. We also launched the book with David Manning, covering all of world-class from Fritz von Erich's booking sheets back in the January of 1982. Next month, we're launching Making the Town. That's right. We've broken down the booking sheets. We've broken down the world titles. Now we'll break down the buildings. All of this happens at adfreeshows.com. Uh, stay tuned, hit the subscribe button and tune in next week for Genesis 07. But Jeff, there's some breaking news that happened while you and I were recording. Get out of here. Auburn has fired their head coach. <laughs> okay. Have they got a replacement yet? Well, it just happened like eight minutes ago. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, so they fired him on Nick Saban's birthday. Of course, the internet is, uh, blowing up. Will it be Lane Kiffin? Will it be Deion Sanders? Will it be Hugh Freeze? I don't know who it'll be, but I know that they paid che cheese Whiz Gene Chizik, $7.5 million to leave town. Gus Malzahn got $21.45 million to pack it up. And now Harson is getting $15 million. Is there a better gig in America than to be a fired head coach? I think it might be my favorite gig of all, <laughs> you know, I, I don't even know where to start. Just the world we live in and the multiples of dollars that go with coming in and not producing and getting paid more than as if you stayed. That don't add up. Well, Auburn had him coach 21 games for him. He won nine of them. That's and, and and he's gonna get paid and have the ability to go somewhere next year. Okay, so he takes a half pay cut in salary or a third, whatever it is. Okay, great. I'm still getting this Auburn money. I got half the pressure of getting 18 year old kids to come in and produce. The the, the eco see where that's where I'm going with it. The economics of the world we live in, guys get paid to not produce. Well, it's funny because I actually said, not trying to be a conspiracy theorist, but I've got a really good friend. Who's a diehard Auburn fan. He's probably 75 years old. And I like to just have him drop some old man business knowledge on me every now and again. Yeah. Let me hear this. So, a couple of weeks ago, we're talking about how, you know, Conrad, he never came and did this and he never came and did that. Talking about a lot of the standard PR stuff that folks usually do when they take over a head coaching job for college football in the South, mm -hmm. he had really good examples. And I said, I'm not trying to be negative or a conspiracy theorist, but do you reckon that some of these guys actually go into this? Because the reality is Auburn takes a look over across the state, sees what Nick Saban's doing and probably says to themselves, selves, why can't we just have what they have? But it's not that easy. Oh, As you yeah. know, when a new coach comes in, he usually brings in his new staff 
And he's also got to have a chance to have his recruiters go out and develop his system and recruit kids to play in that system. So I would argue, maybe we didn't give this guy enough time, but when the pressure is so strong to win, win, win right now, like I think even at the post game this past week, I'm probably misquoting this. I think a member of the press corps said, Hey, it feels like Auburn's defense has fallen off in the last few years. Uh, and he says, you mean with kids I didn't recruit and never coach cause I wasn't here. Like it's an unrealistic expectation. Maybe that we're going to ask him to win right away. At least. So, so, uh, but I'm saying now with all these one firing after another with Auburn, it's almost like if you are a coach of, of, of any notoriety. I don't know if I'd want to go to Auburn because they expect you to win right away with other people's kids. And if you don't have a winning season and and do real well and beat Alabama or whatever it may be, it's considered a a colossal failure. I I, I just feel like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know that I'd go there, but I do think sometimes let's erase the, the resume situation and say, well, I can go in there and do my best. And no matter what it is, it ain't going to be good enough. And then they'll pay me to go home. So I can get paid tens of millions of dollars to do nothing. And this is the only opportunity out there. Like whoever's going to Auburn next, I think you got to go in thinking I'm, if I get a long enough contract, that's a seven year deal. I'll work three and get paid to fart into the couch cushion for four years. It's bizarre, dude. I mean, it is really, really, really bizarre. I I think in another life, I want me and you both to come back as head football coaches. Sign me up. And we'll just, we'll, we'll be like that famous meme where we're just looking at each other, open a bottle of hot sauce, pouring over our wings. Look at us. Just look at us. Just getting paid to do nothing. Just sit right here and do nothing. Uh, one more time, say it in a loud and clear voice this weekend. You got Tennessee. In the points? Oh, Tennessee in the points. Big time, pal. And you got Roman Reigns, right? Oh, yeah. I'm going Georgia and Logan Paul. It's going to be fun texting you. Oh, all you're time. not. Yes, I am. Good luck, boys. Saddle Amen. up. My world never stops. We'll see you next week right here with Jeff Jarrett every week. It's my world. Peace. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you can notice any time we upload some new content. And go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30-year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money. It's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com.